Welcome to this presentation of the Rotary Club of North Bethesda, Maryland, USA. Our club was established in 1974. We meet every Friday morning at 7.45 a.m. and we often invite guest speakers to give presentations on all kinds of interesting subjects. Please contact us through our website at nbrotary.org. And thanks for watching. Our speaker today is Judith Wells. She will be introduced by North Bethesda Rotary Club member, Linda Bergcross. It is time for our speaker. And Judy, I can see you. Judy, can you hear me okay? <laughs> I can hear you. It's wonderful. I'm sorry I was having so much trouble connecting, but I connected. Here I am. Good to see you all. Good morning. <laughs> Judith Wells is a writer who has authored local history books about the area. She lives very A former journalist, she was a reporter for newspapers in Poughkeepsie, New York, and in Arlington, Virginia, and a work life editor for online media in Washington, D.C. She's been a, column, a columnist and blogger for a tech magazine. She was also a media relations manager and speechwriter. U.S. cabinet members and several federal agencies before returning to manage communications at Price Waterhouse Coopers and IBM. She volunteers at the CNO Canal and has served on the board of the CNO Canal Trust. A speaker on local history, she has two books Captain John, Legends in Life of an Uncommon Place. And her most recent book, Potomac, which was published in 2019. So thank you, Judy. Take it away. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, oh, I love the pooch, I see. <laughs> So, yes, um, this is based on a book that I've written, um, but I want to, a lot of people um, wonder, what is Cabin John? What, where does the name come from? And maybe perhaps that's why you all invited me. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but there are a lot of legends. And also, this bridge, uh, on one side is Glen Echo, and on the other side is Cabin John. It is on, um, you cross it, it's a one-lane bridge. You can cross it today on MacArthur Boulevard. Are you all familiar with that? Is that yeah. something? Yeah, okay, there you go. And this cabin under the bridge, and this postcard, by the way, is from around 1900. It is a postcard. You can get it on eBay at, in the day. It was two cents. Today, it's about $15. You can actually get this postcard. This is not John of the Cabin's cabin. This happens to be the cabin or house of the photographer who took the picture. And um, this area here, this is the Cabin John Creek. It is now uh, Cabin John Park, uh, Clara Barton Parkway. You all on the way to work, if you're going to Washington, many of you may go uh, right through here. Uh, however, you're not going actually through the bridge anymore. You're going beside it for uh, Cabin John Parkway. Anyway, so today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about the legends and how we came to the name Cabin John and a little bit more about this area that some of you may know. So this poem appeared in the Washington Star in 1913 and it is reported in the Star of that day that it was found in 1816 in a grain bin, old grain bin. And truly there were, um, there were you know, grain bins back in the day. There were you know, places uh, that uh, harvested the wheat and made flour. Um, and so here's the, this is sort of the classic story of John of the Cabin. If you think that Cabin John is about John of the Cabin, he was a curious white. Now white, can also mean, it's Old English, a ghost. Sprang out of the river one dark stormy night. So there was a river and yes, indeed, the Cabin John I'm telling you about is the one that is by the Potomac River and the CNO Canal. It is not the place called Cabin John Village, which has no history to it. That's up on Tuckerman Lane. You may be familiar with that. This is the real community of Cabin John. So John of the Cabin sprang out of the river, Potomac River, and he built a warm hut. There you come to the cabin idea. 
and lived many years on fishes and meat. So he was a hunter and a fisherman. And when the last lone raccoon on the creek he had slain, it is said he jumped into the river again, as no name to the creek by the ancients was given. It was called Cabin John, after John went to heaven. So the Washington Star reported that this had been found in 1816 in the grain bin. And of course, you know, you believe everything you read in the paper, right? And so here's an early book, also printed around 1900, called Picturesque Cabin John, and there's that bridge. And this is a drawing, which they called a, they actually called it a picture of the cabin. So the idea of a cabin, and that there was a cabin and a John, has been a very long history in the area of Cabin John. But who was John of the cabin? So then we come to this book. It's an actual book. It's a romance novel, The Legend of the Female Stranger, a tale of Cabin John Bridge. There's the bridge again. And Old Alexandria. I don't know if any of you have heard the story in Alexandria of the female stranger, but the idea is that there is a grave there and it actually has this writing on it, which is in the book. It says the memory of a female stranger whose mortal sufferings terminated on the 14th day of October, 1816 again, age 23, eight months. Anyway, this novel though, is about a, a man named John Trust, who was uh, British and he was a soldier and was uh, in love with a nobleman's, a nobleman's daughter. Um, and he was courting her, but of course her father would have nothing to do with it. He, she, he didn't want her marrying an ordinary so soldier. He wanted her to marry noble. So he, he accosted uh, John one day and said, get off the property. I don't want you here. This is all in the novel. It's a romance no novel. And John says, um, I'm in love with her. I want to marry her. And they get into a fight. And by accident, in the, all the scuffling, um, her... Guardian falls and he dies. And she says to John, John, we must, we must leave because they'll, they'll hunt you down. They'll hang you. We must leave. And so they get on a boat. This is, this is the story in the novel. They get on a boat and they travel across the, the great pond, right? And they land in Alexandria. However, on the way, this is a long trip back in the day, 1800s, 1816, she becomes deathly ill and he carries her to Gatsby's Tavern. This is in the book. And there she dies. But before she dies, she says to her lover, John, bury me with no name or they will uh, come after you. So he buries her, he gets on a, his, a boat, I don't know, a rowboat, I don't know. He rows across the river to a, play, you know, a place that is now Cabin John, but we, he didn't know back then. He get, rows across the river, builds himself a hut where he mourns her until he dies. And the only reason we know this story, according to the book, is that his brother comes looking for him. He finds the hut, he finds the the, a ring that belonged to the family, and he knows his brother has died, and he tells the story. And that's the story. But here this says, the stone is placed here by her disconsolate husband. So apparently they married on the boat in whose arms she sighed out her latest breath and who under God did his utmost even to soothe the cold, dead ear of death. I never heard of that cold, dead ear. Well, whatever. But anyway, this is actually part of it is true. My husband and I went searching for this grave because the book actually tells you it's in St. Paul's Old Episcopal Cemetery in Alexandria. And we come across, we find this. Uh, this is called a um, tablet grave. And on the table top here is this poem. I'm sorry, is this, all this writing about the female stranger. And look, it's, this is all marble. This is all marble. And my husband said, he must have really loved her. <laughs> to build such a, to leave such a grave for her. However, uh, Alexandria has a different view on the, of this story. And by the way, that book was written in 1913, which coincidentally, or perhaps on purpose, 
was the time when the first development in Cabin John was occurring, Cabin John Park, again, by the river. And farmland had been bought up by Mr. J.L. Tomlinson. And Tomlinson had like something like 200 lots that he was trying to sell. And this book comes out about John of the Cabin. Who knows, maybe it's related, I don't know. But in Alexandria, they say that Yes, a woman died at Gatsby's Tavern. They didn't know who she was, but she was very wealthy. She had a purse of much money and the townspeople buried her with uh, and made up this kind of story. That's, that's another Gatsby's Tavern tale, but we don't really know. But nevertheless, we do have John of the Cabin maybe is a guy named John Trust, but then Think about the word cabin John and think about this. This is actually the old English of a land um, grant from 1715. The reason I know it's 1715, and by the way, I located this grant by doing some online research in the archive of Maryland. It's, uh, this one says, it's a land grant. It says basically that the governor grants unto him the said Thomas Fletchell, and this is called Fletchell's Garden. Um, hold on a minute. Uh, I do that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Um, all the tract of parcel land, uh, Fletchell's Garden, on the east side of Potomac River, where Cabin John is, beginning at the bounded black walnut. That's how they marked off property back in the day, back in the early days. They would put rope around a, around a tree and, and rope around another tree, and that was the property line. Beginning at a bounded black walnut, a lot of black walnuts in Cabin John, standing at the mouth of Captain John's Run on the 15th of November, 1715. Captain John's Run is today Cabin John Creek. How did they get from Captain John's Run to Cabin John Creek? Say it fast, Captain John. Captain John, Captain John, Cabin John, Cabin John. Try it. Captain John, Captain John, Cabin John, Cabin John. Well, so some people think uh, Cabin John is a corruption of the name Captain John. Not John of the Cabin, Captain John. But who was Captain John? We come on. So, you know, back in the day in the 1800s, there were pirates on the, on the uh, Potomac River. This is actually true. And in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and so, well, again, why would you connect a pirate to Cabin John? The reason you might do it, and this is in my book, um, some of the deeds in Cabin John Actually, um, hold on a second. Some of the deeds have this phrasing in the deed, in the property deed. The party of the first part reserves the right to one half interest in any treasure or articles of special value, which may have been hidden on said lot or parcel by John of the cabin. That's actually in deeds in cabin John uh, and uh, some of the older houses. And, and property. So who would bury treasure? A pirate. And so the, ta the tale of Captain John the pirate is around Cabin John. However, <laughs> so who is the other Captain John that we think about? Some of us do. John Smith, Captain John Smith. And he came in the 1608 Captain John Smith was exploring the Chesapeake Bay. This is the heritage trail for Captain John Smith. And he came up the Potomac River. Here we go, up the Potomac River, just past Washington. And it has been documented that he actually was at Little Falls, which is just before Cabin John. And then in his book, in, the, in his journal, written in 1708 in very quaint old English. He talks about uh, getting off the boat and um, traveling a little more where his boat couldn't go because of the rocks and the, uh, and the gorge. And that sounds like Mather's Gorge and it sounds like Great Falls. And how did he get, you know, on land through there? He had to have crossed 
Captain John Creek. He had to have, or Captain John's Run, or whatever that little body of water might have had no name, which is what the poem said <laughs> back in the day. And later, it became named after him. Uh, for what it's worth, Captain John's Run is Captain John Smith's name, perhaps. For what it's worth, the people in Cabin John actually have adopted this legend or idea, and they celebrate his birthday. So just say, so not his birthday, the day that uh, he, they celebrate the journey. Just so you know. So perhaps, perhaps he's named, uh, Captain John is named after Captain John Smith, but who really knows? Unfortunately, none of this is proven. Hmm. So let's go to Cabin John for a minute. This is my Boulevard back in the day, in around 1912. This is MacArthur Boulevard. Uh, I assume some of you know the area I'm talking about, right? Near the bridge. And this was open farmland, no houses. But there is a fellow, believe it or not, that is a small little guy over there. But anyway, I think he's um, just walking. Um, by the way, did you know that this road was never meant to be a road. It was meant to be the cover for the Washington Aqueduct. Did you know that the Washington Aqueduct that carries public water from Great Falls to Washington, D.C. with not a drop coming into Maryland, not a drop, it's all underground under MacArthur Boulevard into Washington, D.C. This is a picture. This is a picture, original picture of the actual digging down for that um, let me see if I can do this. For the uh, first aqueduct, and on the left here, giving you an idea of how 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 big the conduit or uh, pipes are, nine foot in diameter. Uh, this is all under MacArthur Boulevard going through Cabin John, and that's why there are two aqueduct bridges in Cabin John, because there are valleys in Cabin John, and the bridge carries carries the pipes across. Um, this is not from um, the original. This, there are two aqueducts in, uh, that carry water to uh, Washington. The original one here was there. And this is the second one. You can see the men uh, don't look like they were from 1858 when it started. So this aqueduct was built uh, during the Civil War. And by the way, MacArthur Boulevard was originally called Conduit Road because it was the cover for the aqueduct. But then the farmers had a way to get there, uh, a better way than muddy roads, because this was an actual um, macadam cover. They could take it, you know, that way into Washington, D.C. And so the Conduit Cover, be Conduit Road, became a road. Um, it was renamed, by the way, MacArthur Boulevard. You can understand why in the Second World War after somebody we know, General MacArthur. But why, why would they change the name from Conduit Road to MacArthur Boulevard in the Second World War? To hide the aqueduct from the enemy. So they wouldn't know it was under MacArthur Boulevard and who knows, bomb it, attack it. And by the way, um, in more recent years, uh, in our wars in Afghanistan and various places, um, I, I, I don't know if it's back on, uh, all maps of the aqueduct were taken off internet for the same reason, to protect the aqueduct. Anyway, uh, I don't know if they're back on. This bridge, which some of you have crossed, was originally called the Union Arch, and here's when it was built, 1857 to 1863, right through the Civil War. At the time, and again, it was because of this valley, and Glen Echo was over here, and Cabin John over here. Um, the longest single arch stone, sorry, the longest single span stone arch in the world, and historic, and like a place to come see. You know, people would go to the Washington Monument, literally, and come here to see this bridge. 
Uh, and th that's why there were postcards, tons of postcards. And that's why the uh, photographer, Alex Yowell, who had the cabin under here on the other side of the bridge where you can't see it right now, um, that's why he was taking pictures. Uh, but anyway, uh, Captain Miggs, who later became a general, um, is the, uh, was the uh, supervisor of this project. He, by the way, also designed um, Arlington Cemetery. And if you ever go to the public, what is it called? The Building Museum in Washington, the freeze of Civil War is all because of Captain Meigs. The, so building that arch required a stone trestle. And by the way, do you see those fellows up here? Look at that. I, I've always thought that Captain Miggs was one of these people because you'll see in many pictures of this, of this uh, activity, he, this, this fellow up here, <laughs> he'll be in many pictures. And I think he was a very vain fellow. Anyway, this is a wooden trestle that was the start of the bridge. And um, you can see here where they're putting the stone in the trestle. During the Civil War, they built this trestle, but then they were worried that uh, the Confederates would burn it, take it down. So they took it down. It went up twice up and down twice during the Civil War. And finally, they left it up to put this in. And this is uh, when it was finally opened in 1862. And what you have here are the uh, Union Army crossing, going back, you know, caissons, Army caissons. Here is the Cabin John Creek. Here is a, this is not John of the Cabin's place, <laughs> this, nor is this. Uh, these were um, places for the workmen. And here is these folks looking at it. Uh, but they had to dam the uh, Cabin John Creek in order to um, not only um, to allow <clears throat> some of this construction, but also to float some of the material to the bridge which came, by the way, by the CNO Canal boats. This is the bridge, two lanes, trucks, kids, pedestrians in the 1940s, early 50s. And believe it or not, I don't know if any of you have crossed this bridge when it was two lanes. I have. It was, because I've lived here a while, it was two lanes until 1974. And today, obviously, um, I mean, I, I have friends, I don't remember this, but I have, fr um, yeah. I have friends who, who remember coming across in, in old Oldsmobiles with the big wings on the cars and feeling like, you know, the wings were going to be taken off and all this. Uh, but this is quite amazing that they could take two trucks across and you know, in pedestrians. So what happened in 1974 is this part of the bridge right here, just a little part, only about, I think it was about uh, seven or eight feet. This kind of part of this fell off down below onto Clara Barton Parkway. There were no cars there at the moment, at the time it fell. So no one was hurt. But because that happened, that provided a time for the county to consider what to do with this bridge. And they decided, and Cabin John said, if you're going to repair anything, please provide a way for us to walk across this bridge. Believe it or not, before 1974, there are stories, and it's really true, where kids, people actually walked across the top here. <laughs> and nobody fell. And there are no stories of anybody falling from this bridge although there is a story of a suicide, but that's a, a, an adult. And in fact, here's another little story here. The, um, the original, the first school for Cabin John was in Glen Echo. So the kids had to cross the bridge to get to school. Then it was moved back over to Cabin John in 1926. So before 1926, yeah, a lot of kids were walking across this. That's amazing, isn't it? Anyway, it's now one lane. Hey, here's another picture of the bridge. And look, there's that fellow again, I told you. Isn't it amazing? I don't know who this guy is, but I think it's Miggs. But anyway, <laughs> um, so 
here's the other story of the bridge. Uh, this is again around, oh, 1862 or so. Um, Joseph Bobbiger was a stonemason on the bridge. His wife, Rosa, was a great cook. They, they lived in this place. This is their little buggy, and this is his, um, you know, uh, smoker. And she made this incredible dish, apparently, that was called chicken a la Maryland. And she would make it for the workers. And chicken a la Maryland is the kind of food we're not, we're not allowed to eat today, <laughs> which is chicken and gravy and biscuits and a little bacon in there too. Um, and it was so good that everybody kept wanting to have Rosa's cooking. So, so Joseph's thinking about this. He knows that people are coming to see this historic engineering structure. He knows his wife's a good cook. And he says, hey, I think people are going to need a place to stay and they're going to need something to eat when they come visit all those tourists. I think we need a hotel. So he goes and he gets a loan from the Bank of Baltimore in 1870. You know, the war's over. He starts building this. Here's the same bridge, the same picture. His house, there's no little shack here anymore. What there is, is this hotel called the Cabin John Bridge Hotel. This was, by the way, where the, uh, this was the stables where the horses were kept. Okay, this is now 1870. No, actually this picture is not, <clears throat> sorry. This picture is from 1890, but it, it, the hotel's now been built. This is Cabin John again, and the other side of the bridge is Glen Echo. This is the hotel. Look at look at this great balcony. Look at all the bikes. And again, the bridge would be on this side over here. The people come across the bridge, and it's right there. This is the um, entrance to where the horses and the stables were. Picture from the back. This is by 1900. This was the place to go. And how you got there was by trolley because in 1890, there were trolleys from Georgetown that came to Cabin John. In fact, people who live in Cabin John were able to ride the same trolley uh, into Washington, into Georgetown until 1960. Wow. Yeah. And at the time, we get, we'll get questions. Um, so you get off the trolley and you'd cross this. this. is not the Cabin John Bridge. It was a metal pedestrian bridge erected right beside it. You'd cross the, get off the trolley, cross the bridge to the hotel. Now this is the picture. This is incredible. There's, there's the Cabin John Bridge and there is the pedestrian bridge that was built. So you could cross from, from the trolley and the Glen Echo side of the bridge over to the hotel. This is the Cabin John Creek. It's winter, look at the snow. And by the way, they didn't pile up that snow. That's how the snow was. Uh, but there's the bridge, oh. it's incredible. And this is what was inside the hotel. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm a dog. <laughs> you know, I was waiting for him to start. Um, this is a very ornate hotel. And this is the China. And by the way, oh, I should have brought to show you. I have a piece of the China, which by the way, is very expensive on eBay still. I'll explain to you how it gets onto eBay. But this is an example of what happened. Look at these people all in their finery. What happens when you come to dine at the Cabin John Bridge Hotel in 1903? By now, Rosa is not really the main cook here. Uh, they have fine chefs from other, uh, other things. But General Harry's, I don't know who General Harry's is, but he wanted to do a grand dinner for 25 people or 24 people. The reason I know it's 24 is because there were 24 oyster cocktails for $6, okay, 24 of them. Uh, there were 24 cups of broth for $6. And 12 people had bass, 12 people had salad, 12 people had sweetbreads. I don't know if you all know what sweetbread is. Um, 12 people had potted grouse. You see that? 12 people had ice cream. 
The total bill for 24 people is $110.85, don't you wish? But that, back in the day, was one kind of special meal. Um, and I wanted to uh, give you a, a note of the time, Judy, that uh, we have about two minutes left. You can okay. continue to go, but I have to, I have to officially end the meeting at 7.30. That does not mean you have to stop, and I want you to stay for questions if you have questions, but I do have to end the meeting in two minutes. I just want to give you a heads up. So do you want to have me stop so you can do an ending of the meeting kind of thing? I stop. I just want you to pause. because Okay, is fine. Awesome. Fine. This is the view from the hotel. Um, actually, this is almost over now. And uh, but uh, there's the Potomac River. What an incredible view. And this is a gazebo where uh, John Philip Sousa's band played, that uh, kind of thing. This was in winter, uh, a, a Denzel carousel and a, um, a roller coaster. And this is all that remains. The gas house, uh, which is behind the tennis court at Cabin John Park when you get off the bridge. It's also designated historic by Montgomery County. The reason it's all that remains is because in the 1920s, we had prohibition. And so the hotel's business had went off because they were, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't serve uh, beer or wine. Wine was upstairs, beer was in the Rathskeller, you couldn't serve it. So uh, business totally slumped off. And in 1926, they closed the hotel because no one was coming. And in 1931, there was a fire and it burned. And that was, that's why we don't have it today. Today, and there's that postcard, you can actually find the silver from the hotel. This is a demi tasse cup. It costs five hundred dollars for a three inch demi tasse cup. Um, from again showing the Cabin John Bridge Hotel, because back in the day, two things you could carry out from the hotel. You could carry out, but they didn't have paper. You carried out the silver. You carried out you know, your tray of uh, coffee and whatever, you carried it out. And of course, most times you brought it back. Sometimes you didn't. And it's ended up in your family, you know, closet. And so some of this ends up on eBay and you can search eBay for Cabin John and you'll find a million postcards and occasionally a piece of china or silver, very expensive today. This is Cabin John today. I'm almost finished. Um, this is uh, this was the original uh, built in 1931, a firehouse that now is a cleaners and an architectural firm because the fire engines have gotten too big for the firehouse, so they can't. They had to move them to to River Road. The Cabin Jump Park Volunteer Fire Department is on River Road and also in Potomac, two two uh, firehouses, and this shows you you know the typical large house of today taking down some of these older houses. This is a Sears kit house. I'm sure you know what that is, where you know you ordered your house from a catalog and it came in parts and you put it together. There are a number of these houses in Cabin John. So Cabin John had the world's longest single arch stone bridge. By the way, today it is the longest single arch stone bridge in the United States, not in the world, but in the United States. And that is true and a hotel where three presidents dined uh, back in the day, and two of the six bridges, the biggest one you saw, the other one is now a pedestrian bridge. So there we go. And if you're interested in more of this and the book, I have a website, you can order it from there or this way. Um, you know, Bethesda Co-ops, Joe Snyder's in Potomac. It is in the library if you're interested and I'm happy to take questions. See, all done. <laughs> Very, very interesting. Thank you, Judith. Just as a point of information, I rode that trolley 1953 from Washington to Cabin John. Wasn't that I amazing? Rode, I rode, yeah, I rode that trolley many, many, many times. From Georgetown, where they uh, uh, raised the underground electric connection and raised the uh, the top uh, connection as we went through the woods uh, all the way to the, the roundabout at the end where the train turned around and you can ride the number 20 trolley today where I took my grandchildren 
uh, and the uh, the trolley museum. Out oh, in perfect! <laughs> I love it. That's wonderful. Um, I, 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 I don't know how we can continue the discussion, but the the actual audio video connection has to be closed down yeah. if I have to leave and have to move on. <laughs> so I've got patients in my office, so I have to uh, pretty close it down. I guess you might find a way to connect. Um, well, maybe we'll just close it off and we'll have it back another time. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful. That Thank you great. all. I've enjoyed Thank it. Have, have a great day. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.